Ambassador Martin. Thank you for being with us today. Could you please introduce yourself and the work that you're currently doing? I am Ambassador Martin Uhamoibi. Uh, I was formerly president of the United Nations Human Rights Council and president of the World Intellectual Property Organization some years back. Uh, in, uh, as a career diplomat, I was the head of the Nigerian Foreign Ministry as permanent secretary for five years from 2010 to 2014. Thereafter, I was assigned as Under Secretary General of the United Nations by Ban Ki-moon to head one of the largest peacekeeping missions in the world in Darfur, Sudan. That was in 2016, 2017. Upon my return, I, I got engaged uh, on part-time basis teaching at three universities in Nigeria. The Catholic University Veritas in Abuja, Bayes University in Abuja, and currently visiting professor at Igbenidian University in Edo State of Nigeria. In addition to all of this, I am the founder and president of the Pan-African Institute for Global Affairs and Strategy, where really my office, permanent office is. And here we do a lot of things, including um, raising young people to their consciousness and sensitivities about the need for peace in our world, in our troubled world. I think diplomacy uh, is very critical in establishing world peace. World peace cannot be achieved by violent means. Violence begets violence. And diplomacy even definitionally means the deployment of, of ways, strategies for achieving peace in order to foster relations between nations, either bilateral or multilateral. So I think diplomacy is very critical to building sustainable peace. Diplomacy is the use of nonviolent means to achieve peace, to ensure that there is a conversation between two entities, sovereign entities. You have to be diplomatic, you have to employ diplomacy, the tools of diplomacy, uh, political, economic, uh, and whatever ways of achieving that peace. But conversation is key. Representation is key. Reporting progress between nations is key. Deployment of peace as an instrument for relations, forging relations between countries is the only way to, to build in a world where there is equity, justice, and respect for human rights. So I think diplomacy is absolutely essential. And it is the only way by which peace, sustainable peace can be built and developed. Thank you, Ambassador Martin. I also agree that diplomacy is very important. Now, our next question is about United Nation. As we all know that you have uh, worked in United Nation for a long time, and from your perspective, what is the mandate of United Nation and what was your role when you worked in the United Nation? Well, if you recall history, the United Nations Charter on which the United Nations was built resulted from the San Francisco Conference of 1945. That conference had 51 countries represented in it that signed the charter that gave birth to the United Nations. And the primary reason for establishing the United Nations is enchanted in the preambular paragraph of the UN Charter, which says, to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, which twice in our lifetime have brought untold hardships to humankind. So the United Nations was created to save the world from peace, sorry, from crisis, from wars. Many human beings were tired of wars. 53 million lives were lost in the, in, in the first, in the Second World War. That is what can be registered. Can you imagine what would happen if there was a Third World War? Whether you were the one who caused the war or you're the one who started or didn't cause the war, the world would be destroyed almost horrendously. So we hope it doesn't happen. So the United Nations was created to stop succeeding generations from the scourge of war. And the UN has done fairly well, reasonably well. It doesn't mean that we have not had wars. We've had actually more deaths uh, in this period than we had in the whole of the Second World War period. But at least we've not had a global war. 
And global war now will be very catastrophic for, all, for the entire human race. So the UN has done well. It doesn't mean that it cannot do better. And it doesn't mean that there are no areas of reform that are needed to make the UN perform even better. And the earlier those gaps are filled, the better for humanity. Thank you, Ambassador. Now, the second part of the question was, what was your role in the United Nations? Well, I've, I've worked several, uh, several times in the UN, uh, either representing my country. I was a diplomat for 30 years from 19, uh, 1984 until 1914. I served my country as a career diplomat. And uh, uh, in 1993, we were elected to the Security Council in 1994, uh, and I was privileged to be the alternate representative of my country. We were on the Security Council. I was the alternate representative of Nigeria to the Security Council. Even when I returned back to Nigeria, I was working in the United Nations division of my ministry and did many things that rebounded on the United Nations. So that was also very, very useful, even though from a Nigerian perspective. And deployed to Darfur, Sudan to head uh, the UNAMID, United Nations and African Union uh, uh, peacekeeping mission in Darfur, Sudan. The United Nations was involved in Sudan for many years uh, in trying to mediate the conflict that raged internally in Sudan. And I was privileged to head that, that body for that period from 2016 to 2017. Uh, it was a very uh, interesting period for me and I've actually documented it. I've written a book on that. It's called Diplomacy in the Desert, which tells the story of my, uh, of my handling of that, of that mission. Thank you, Ambassador Martin, for your answer. You mentioned that the UN is doing what they, what they can do the best, but it can improve, which I also agree. Um, so in context of Russia and Ukraine war, what do you think the additional role of United Nations can be? Well, what can be, I mean, who is the UN? The UN is not one human being. The UN is the United Nations. And there are 193 countries that make up the United Nations. So there are 193 member countries of the United Nations. What could we collectively as members have done that we did not do that has result, well, that has in the, in the face of the present crisis? Uh, the organization, international organizations, international organizations are as powerful as the member states want it to be. Uh, I'm afraid that in international politics, which is an elastic concept in itself, it's not cast in stone. The dominant powers tend to have a greater say because they have the powers. So the United Nations is structured or was created at a time that three quarters of the present members of that body were not members, where they, didn't, where they were not party to it. They were either colonies or how many African states were in San Francisco to, to bring about the Charter of the United Nations? There is need for a reform of the United Nations. And we've been talking about reforming the UN for, for decades now. The point I was making basically was that the Charter itself was crafted at a time that three quarters of its present membership, almost three quarters of its present membership, were colonies or were not members. They were not there in San Francisco. Let me speak for Africa. Today, Africa is made up of 54 countries or 55 countries. How many African countries were there in, in San Francisco to, to, to sign the charter? They were colonies. They were being dominated and exploited and they had no independence. So to what extent was the charter representative of their own interests? It's left for you and I to say, those who colonized you, did they represent your interests? What was the purpose? Why was the UN actually created at the time it was created? Yes as stated in the charter, to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. Which war? Who caused those wars? There are five permanent members of the Security Council, and the Security Council is the most important body in the UN that has primary responsibility for the maintenance of global peace and security. There are five permanent members who will veto. Not one out of, not one African country out of the 55 countries in Africa today is represented on a permanent basis in the Security Council. How can you justify that? How representative is that? How democratic is that? How equitable is that? How just and fair is that? That one country alone by exercising veto can nullify a decision of the entire system. And these countries have been agitating 
since the 60s for equity and justice in the Security Council. The world is, has changed in 70 years or 77 years. Why is the Security Council as presently constituted the same as it was in 1945, in spite of the changes that have occurred economically, politically, demographically, and in terms of contribution to global peace and security? Let us quantify, let us put it on the table and determine all those members who have been excluded and yet who have put their lives on the line to ensure global peace and security, like Nigeria. Is Nigeria a permanent member of the Security Council? Why should Nigeria not be there? Why is there no African country represented as a permanent member of the Security Council? So there are issues that needs to be resolved and we have to deal with ourselves honestly and fairly. But I'm afraid global politics is not about honesty, it's about games. But until it changes, and those changes will not be brought by those who are beneficiaries of, or what, of the present status quo. It will be brought by those who are uncomfortable and who, are, who feel that there is need for, that they are inequitably treated, unjustly treated, not being democratically treated, fairly treated, until those people stand up and say, hey, we have to have a better system, a reformed UN, properly speaking. It is when that happens that you will have a really, really representative, equitably represented, representative United Nations. Thank you, Ambassador Martin, for your passionate answer. I could definitely feel your heart sincerity towards the work you do. Once again, thank you very much for your answer. Now, we're going to shift a question a little bit towards HVPL question. Um, now, if you can recollect some of your memories from 2016 about your participation to the World Peace Summit in, um, that was held by HVPL, now, what was the most memorable for you? What impressed me was that one man could bring the whole world to Seoul. Because just being at the stadium or at that open place and seeing the massive crowd of people across the gender, across the races of the world, across the religious divides in this world, all under one, all in one unit, brought by, together by this man called Chairman Lee, a man of God and a man of peace. All of them is regardless of our race, of our religion, of our gender, regardless of our creed, all assembled on one spot in Seoul to advocate peace for humanity. It was very, very moving and very impressive for me. And the memory endures even years after that. And that's what we must all do either in our kitchen, either in our churches, either in our marketplaces, either in our offices, we all should be altars for peace, messengers of peace, our advocates of peace. Chairman Lee exemplified that by his action and he lived it out in practice. And I am sure he is peace himself that he has been able to do that. Thank you, Ambassador Martin. Now, our next question is about the Declaration of Peace and Cessation of War, the DPCW. Now, when you heard about HUPL drafting this uh, declaration, what was your first impression? Well, the DPCW was it's a fantastic document with articles and uh, specifications, almost like the Charter. I think it's an incredibly exhaustive document, uh, which should be taught in schools. Uh, and which I think will benefit the whole of humanity and mankind. I don't know how far you have gone with getting it adopted by the United Nations, but it will seem to me that the United Nations Charter of San Francisco in 1948, 1940, 1945, needs some revision. And particularly, the Universal Declaration on Human Rights of 1948 can benefit a lot from the message of the DPCW. So I think there should be an effort on our part as associates and friends of AWPL to really market that document uh, with governments across the world uh, by getting your own um, critical mass to market this uh, so that it can be elements from there can be incorporated into the United Nations San Francisco Charter. It is possible and it is doable, but we just have to raise an awareness and make sure that that DPCW becomes available across the world uh, to places that matter. 
even to academic institutions, because those academic institutions, universities globally produce people who now go into the foreign service of their respective countries and who go into other agencies of government and of international organization so that it will become properly disseminated and become part of the, of the global, uh, uh, global document that we use in the United Nations. Thank you, Thank you Ambassador Morton. Um, you've mentioned how United Nations Charter has been about 70, 80 years now, um, and there is a need of revision. I think you also mentioned how the document like the DPCW can also be useful in terms of the revision. Did I understand you correctly, sir? Yes, that's, that's quite correct. The charter needs to be revised, needs to be reformed. But those who are, because really, as I said, those who put the charter together were just a few countries, really. And only 51 countries were present for the signing in San Francisco in 1945, 51 countries. Today, you have 194 member countries of the United Nations. So it's just only a quarter of the present membership today. How can that document continue to be seen as representing the interest of every other? who were not there, who were colonized and had been exploited. Where is there today no African country, no African face as a permanent member of the Security Council? Why? Is that democratically, is that equitable? Is that just, is that fair? Is that representative? Who determines who is a permanent member? What are the yardsticks? Except that you fought the Second World War. You created the Second World War. You created the environment for it. And you fought the war. So I couldn't have fought the war because I was colonized. But even my ancestors were soldiers. They went and fought to liberate those countries. But today, they are non-permanent members of the Security Council. And one vote from one country, these questions need to be addressed in the interest of fairness and justice and equity. Thank you, Ambassador Martin. Now, we're going to shift our question back to the DPCW. Um, now, you have mentioned earlier how DPCW should be led known to the whole world, uh, which is, I think, what HUTL is also doing. But in regarding of the content of the DPCW or the approach of the DPCW, what do you think uh, there can be some improvements regarding it? Well, I can't just think on the spot about that. But I just need for you, for HWPI, to be aware that we, we need conscientization and we need awareness. HWPA should do what it can do to increase awareness of the existence of such a document and keep the world as engaged with DPCW and the elements that it advocates through whatever means that we are able to mobilize for that purpose. Thank you, Ambassador Martin. Now, our next question is based on different answers that we received during the uh, different kinds of interviews. One of the hindrance, the roadblocks that many people have chosen was a politics uh, when it comes to creating world peace. Now, do you also think the same way? Do you think politics is also uh, one of the largest hindrance when it comes to making the world peace? You know why I'm laughing? I'm laughing because you and I are political animals. Politics is part of our nature. It's part of our humanity. The human being is, is politics, it's political. By nature, human beings are political animals. We, we have to be political. You can't run away from politics, depending on how you play it. Politics is good, can be good, but it can also be terrible when you play it badly. So I wouldn't be satisfied with just describing politics as a hindrance. No, it is bad politics that is bad. And if there was no politics, there would be no country, and I wouldn't be here talking to you, there is politics played according to the rules. Imagine if there was no United Nations, what the world would be like in the past 77 years. It would be terrible. That moderator would not be there. That balancer would not be there. That forum that brings the whole world together for three months in New York every year to discuss issues of interest. Not, there's no, no substitute for that as far as achieving global peace and security is concerned. So I think that is half of what I can say about that. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Martin, for your answer regarding politics. I do agree with you. Our next question is about Mindanao. Chairman Lee has visited Mindanao, which I'm sure you already are aware of, uh, to sign a civil peace agreement uh, to seize a religious conflict that has been going on for more than 40 years. But this was done from a side of foreigner, from an organization that started in a foreign country. Now, I want to ask you, how do you evaluate this work? Well, I think that was truly historic and it was very divine. And I also commend the, 
the factions in Mindanao, the Catholics and the, and the Muslims that came together for peace. But here comes a third party, here comes a foreigner in the person of Chairman Lee. He goes in there, he has the credibility, the integrity, and he brings it to bear. And above all, the humanity and the godliness that is required in such things. So that truly was a, an incredible achievement. Uh, and we need many more of that kind of interventions in places. Uh, but I would also like to strongly commend the Filipinos themselves, because if the Muslims and the Catholics did not have a mind for peace, a true yearning for peace, he would not have been able to do what he did. So they also had peace inside of them and they yearned to have peace. And that was why it eventually happened. And a man of peace came and they were- Thank you, Ambassador Martin. Now, for next question, I want to ask you, it may be a little bit sensitive, but if it's not too sensitive for you to answer, I want to hear your perspective about Russia, Ukraine, a war that is ongoing at the moment. Could you please share with us? It is very unfortunate, in fact, that this conflict is taking place at this time. And I feel particularly sorry for the Ukrainians because they are the victims, ultimately. As a scholar, you have to be broad-minded in looking at the issues on ground. Nothing can justify what is going on now. Nothing, nothing on earth. Just like you really cannot justify any war. There is no just war. War is war and it's evil. War is evil and should be avoided. So no matter what any side will argue in this case of the war in, 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 in Ukraine, there is no justice in it. It is not excusable by whomsoever this war has been created. And I am very sorry for the innocent children, women, and men in Ukraine who are going to be the ultimate victims of this war. Peace, the alternative of peace should have been sought to resolve this conflict. Diplomacy has not been deployed fully. I'm afraid that has not been done. This resort to war is a disaster for all. There will be no winner and there will be no loser. Sorry, all will be losers, as indeed happens in all wars. I think I can stop there. Thank you, Ambassador Morton. Truly, for all your answers, even if the question was a, li a little bit sensitive, I want to thank you very much for all your passionate answers today. I know you're very busy and um, yes, we did wait a little while to meet you, but I think it was a definite worth to uh, wait for you. But thank you once again for all your sincere answers and I hope to see you again. Have a great day. Thank you. Come Samida.